right? Very, 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 very important result. Uh, it's so important, it's titled The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. We've talked about a lot of other things in the past, um, all about derivatives and recently about integrals or antiderivatives. And today we're going to see the theorem which connects them together. Um, fundamental, right? If something's a fundamental, like in basketball, if you know the fundamentals, in football, if you know the fundamentals, and Whatever it is, if you know the fundamentals, that means you know like the basic tools. Like the important, most important, right, basic tools of whatever it is. This is that most basic fundamental tool of calculus. Okay? So every theorem we've seen about derivatives up to this point is not as fundamental as this. There's supporting work for this, but they're not the fundamental tools, the fundamental things. The fundamental theorem of calculus can be drawn kind of as a picture. So I'll take a continuous function. On some interval. So like I've done before. So from A to B, I've got a continuous function. I'm going to start from the left here, and I'm going to start accumulating area from A over to some point. So I'm going to draw a vertical line at some input x, or some value x, and I'm going to start evaluating and finding that area, bounded by x equals a, the vertical line x equals a, bounded by the x-axis, bounded by the line x equals the right-hand side of this, so x equals x, x prime equals x, and then bounded above by the function. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let x move around. For the graph that I've shown you, as I let x go to the right over towards b, right, this area is going to grow. It's all positive from a to b, so this integral, this area that we're adding up, just grows. Okay? So now I'm going to treat the function of what is that red area with respect to x. Right? So I've got now a function. You give me an x, I find the area, and I give you that area. You give me a different x over here, I compute the new area, I give you that area. That's a new function, right? So this area function has one variable, and it's the position of this vertical line that you draw between A and B. Okay? And it just tells you the area. This is really kind of well-defined if we've got a continuous function. Okay. If we don't have splittings of our curve up here, if we indeed have a function, then the area that I'm finding is well-known. If I've got a continuous function, then I don't have strange asymptotes happening where the area becomes infinity. Right? So I, I can give you actually a number. You give me an x, I give you the area. That's the function we're talking about. How do we write that function down in terms of what we've seen so far? So that area is, I'll say capital F of x. Actually, your book says little g of x. Let me write it that way. Sorry. Using what we've learned so far, we say this is 
a sum of all those little rectangles. The left endpoint, the lower limit of our integral of our areas, is we're going to start from A. We're going to add up all the rectangles over to X. And we're finding the area with rectangles height. The function f of t, actually. So I'm going to erase that and say this is now t, just some other placeholder variable. And the width of those rectangles is delta t, which when we let that delta go to 0 becomes a dt differential. And this is just that function. Again, the integral means form rectangles between a and x, right, between this and this, form a bunch of rectangles with heights equal to the function height, and widths equal in size, all of them uniformly, of some delta t, and then let the number of rectangles go to infinity, and that's this. That's what we learned right before Thanksgiving break, a week ago. And now that is a function, right? As x changes, I'm taking the area further to the right or further to the left, depending on what it is. And here's a crazy result. down. These are all the words. This is a function of x. Right? This area. It's an integral where x is my top limit on the integral. f is the height of the function we're taking the area underneath. If I take the derivative of this, with respect to this variable, I literally get this function when you plug in x. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it says the slope of this area function, the slope of this area function, right, is the same as this height. Do you want to see some examples? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's see some examples. Um, let's say I give you this. This is the area underneath this curve. It's the square root of some positive numbers. So it looks something like a root. In fact, it looks kind of like a line, but straight line. We'll get that. Maybe, maybe not. My question is, what is the derivative of that? The fundamental theorem of calculus written at the very top, says, is this continuous? Uh -huh. It's a square root. That's a continuous function. 1 plus t squared. For t, from 0 to x, we're always dealing with numbers that are bigger than 0. In fact, they're always bigger than 1. So we don't even reach that cusp piece. So this is also differentiable in 0 to x. That means right here, if I want to take the derivative of this guy, that integral, I just take this variable and replace the t with it. Okay, 
it's stupid how easy that is, right? Yeah. My first calculus test that had these questions on them, I missed them. I literally missed them. <laughs> I remember talking to my professor afterwards and being like, I had no idea how to find these things. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with the answers. And he said, just read the theorem. And I, re I looked at it, you know, and I said, dang it. Oh, it's so easy. It's one of those things that's so easy that it just slips your mind. Okay? It really is that kind of thing. <laughs> now there's a little bit of setup, right? That X needs to be up here. Okay, this needs to be continuous. You have to be able to differentiate things in here as well. But if these little things are satisfied, then it's seriously as easy as just replace every T in here with that X up there. You're done. Okay? Things can get harder things you might have to like use the chain rule for or what have you, but this is the fundamental result. This is the basic result. Which again, if you think about what we're talking about here, G prime is the rate at which this area changes. So you move X around and the area is changing. If you look at how fast that area is changing, this says the rate at which it's changing is exactly determined by the height of the function at the right hand end point. Okay? So that's like a, that kind of makes sense. This height is positive. You move <coughs> x to the right, it stays positive, so the area increases. This height becomes negative. So if x moves, area becomes more negative, right? Okay, yeah, like this is, this is like so fundamental. Um, yeah, that's that. Part two, this is called part one. of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So there's a part two. f of x between the vertical lines x equals a, x equals b, bounded above by the function, bounded below by the x-axis. That area, this exact area, but now including everything, is the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative forgotten. Part two, never forgotten. Because this is like one of those things that you use all the time. I would say in calculus classes you use part two much, much more often than part one. 
maybe just because we're trying to find areas much more than we're trying to find like the rate of change of areas. So let's see an example. Oh, sorry, one thing to point out. I underlined it. I'm going to start it too. Any antiderivative. You have complete freedom there. Complete. You pick any antiderivative you want. Remember, antiderivatives, capital F, is an antiderivative of little f if, when you take its derivative, you get that function, right? So if I give you little f, you take its antiderivative, you get capital F. That means if you take the derivative back, you know, sending it back over, this is the result. Capital F is an antiderivative of little f if this is always true. So you can pick anything that has this property. So it's a good question of why you can pick anything. Maybe we can look at an example. Um, 0, 2, 2, x, dx. Compute. So what is the area from 0 to 2 underneath this curve, 2x? In a picture, it looks like this. From 0 to 2. What's that area? That's what this is asking. So what this theorem part 2, the fundamental theorem practice part 2 says, do you know an antiderivative for 2x? That's a simple question. Right? You do. And antiderivative is x squared plus 1,000. Right? Take its derivative. What do you get? You get 2x plus nothing. Fantastic. We've got an antiderivative. You can add any number you want here, any number whatsoever. Probably the best choice is plus 0. So this area is equal to this evaluated at 2, and then evaluated at 0, and just subtract. That's what that says. So let me show you how this is usually written. You write first the antiderivative, and then you write a vertical line, and then you say the bottom limit at the bottom, you write it there, and at the top, you write the top limit. This is just how it's usually written. And then this becomes plugging in 2. This is the minus sign turned upwards. 0 plugged in. So this is like the notation. You put the antiderivative here. You put the upper limit, the lower limit, and really what this means is do that. It's kind of like an intermediate step. Okay? Um, so over here, it would be written like f of x, vertical bar, b, a. Like that. It's just a notation thing. So what is that area? It's 4 minus 0. Right? which agrees with the triangle. The base is 2, the height is 4, so what's the area? 1 half base times height, 4. The integral says we can compute that area using just x squared, and we have no issues. any function that you know the antiderivative of, and you can tell me the area underneath it. E to the x looks like this. From 
1 to 3, we're asking what is that area? That's what the integral is computing for us. Fundamental theorem part 2 says pick any antiderivative of this. The Hobbit itself, because that works. Plug in 3, plug in 1, find the difference. That's the area. I can't tell you what numerical approximation that is. E cubed, I don't know. Some number. Minus E. Thank you. But that's the area. So these are key links between derivatives, right, and areas. If you can find the derivative of something and it turns into what's inside this integral, then you can tell me the area underneath this thing from anything to anything else, really, if the function is nice enough behaved. Okay, so let's maybe do some... Maybe just something that's slightly harder. Questions about this so far? Okay, so here's my question. I've said it now. Uh, why doesn't it matter? which anti-derivative we pick. Great question. For this process, finding any anti-derivative, why does that work? Why don't we have to pick a special one? We'll think about it like this. What else could I have put here? Morgan. Plus one. Okay. Could you give me another example, like right off the top of your head? Okay. So any plus any constant. In fact, that's the most general antiderivative, right? If I change that now in any other way, I don't have something which, when I take the derivative of, I do this. So this is the general form. So now when we plug this in, 3, we get e to the third plus the constant, minus, plugging in 1, e to the first plus the constant. What happens to the constant? It cancels. cancels out. Okay. So a long time ago I said like, if you're going to pick like a base for a natural, sorry, for an exponential for logarithm, please pick the natural bases because they make things easy with derivatives and whatnot, right? You remember that? We had an agreement. Pick natural logs. Okay, we're going to have an agreement. Don't write a constant unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> Pick zeros, right? Okay, good. Because it doesn't matter which constant you pick at all. It just makes the process a bit more complicated. Okay, so I've got a couple here. 
one that's like one level of difficulty higher, one that's like a, another la level of difficulty higher than that even? Can you tell me? An antiderivative for x squared. Something that when you take the derivative of it, you get x squared. Yes? Third, x to the third. Take its derivative, you multiply by 3, subtract 1 to get 2, 3 times the third is 1, bingo. Yes? Evaluate it at 0, evaluate it at 1. So we plug in 1, we plug in 0, we subtract in between. So to sketch this, we've got the parabola from 0 to 1, which looks like this. This area is exactly one-third units squared. It's exactly one-third of a square, one unit long on each side. Okay. So the curve x squared carves out a third of that square. That's what that's saying. Very good, very, very good. Next one. derivative for that. It's a good guess. X to the fourth? For the top part. With what? For the top part. Okay, okay, this is good. You're thinking about it piece by piece, which is exactly a good strategy. Okay, systematically going through this piece by piece. So X to the fourth, when you take its derivative, turns into this. Moreover, what's the derivative of X to the fourth plus one? It's that, right? Perfect. I'm going to do a trick here. Is that okay? I'm going to say u is actually x to the fourth plus 1. Right? Is that okay so far? Okay, what's the derivative of u with respect to x? And what is dx? If I solve this for dx, it's it's du divided by 4x to the third. Do you agree? So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to leave out my endpoints here, but this is u on the bottom. Up here is still 4x to the third. dx is du over 4x to the third. Bingo, that cancels with that. This is the integral of 1 over u du, right? Next question, do you know an antiderivative for that? One over x, do you know an antiderivative for that? Natural log. natural log. I'm so happy you chose the natural one, that's perfect. This is a common technique for finding antiderivatives where you kind of systematically think is any piece of what's inside here a derivative of another piece inside here? If yes, take that piece, find its derivative, and replace things inside here with either the thing you're replacing or the derivatives of it. And see if anything cancels out. And it does in this case. So this is the natural log of u but what was u in the beginning? Well that's natural log of x to the fourth plus one right? if 
I drop even the absolute values, it doesn't matter because x to the fourth plus one is always positive. So this integral here becomes that. And now notice I didn't write down the ones and threes in between. I'll get to that in just a second. But here at the end, we can say that that integral is the natural log of x to the fourth plus one from one to three. And we just plug these things in. That's the area. Natural log of 82 minus the natural log of 2. Which is just the natural log of 41. Which I have no idea the numerical approximation of. It can be seen without this whole like replacement business happening. It can be seen that this is in fact the function you should have had at the beginning. So if you notice, we've got a fraction, which makes you think quotient rule right away. But one thing you, one thing you notice is the derivative of the bottom is exactly the top. And you remember your rule for logarithms, I hope. If you have the logarithm of a function, and you take its derivative, what do you get? You get the derivative of that inner function divided by that function, which is exactly what we have here. Right? So this natural log of the bottom here is exactly the function we took the derivative of to get what's inside here. So this example is a great one for showing you like the importance of being able to analyze what's inside an integral and then also being able to recall the derivatives and the patterns for derivatives you've seen in the past. Okay. Building that derivative table is really important. But then this is a technique for finding those things if you've forgotten them you know, in that strange of case. Okay. Questions about the fundamental theorem of calculus so far? What we're finding? What we're doing? Okay. So I'm going to write both parts of the fundamental theorem right next to each other in one succinct statement. Just to sort of view them as right next to each other. What do you call it? Uh, juxtaposition, right? So the FTC fundamental theorem calculus. Let F be continuous on some interval A to B. Not extremely strict. One, g of x equals a to x f t dt, then g prime of x equals f of x. Two, the integral from a to b f x dx equals capital F of t minus capital F of A, where F of X is any antiderivative of little f of X. At the beginning of the year, we talked a lot about what functions are, and we talked about 
certain kinds of functions which you can completely undo. We call these functions invertible functions. Right? I give you some number, you apply a function to it, and you output something else. You give it back to me. Right? What if I started at the reverse end? I gave you the result of some function, and I asked you what must have been inputted to give me that result. That's the inverse problem that we talked a lot about. Part one says the derivative of an integral is a function. Right? This derivative undoes the integral. Part two says to compute the integral, you take some function, which, when you take its derivative, you get what's inside the integral. These two together really are showing you this is kind of an inverse process. An integral adds things up, a derivative breaks them down. If you think about it like a polynomial, or applied to a polynomial, if I take an integral of x squared, what do I get? I get volume of q. What's the antiderivative of x squared? It's 1 third x to the third. If I have a cube that's x units long, that integral tells me the volume of that cube. Okay, now I take the derivative of a cube volume, and I get now this, x squared. That is the area of the side of one cube. Where integrals build things up into higher dimensions, Derivatives tear them down into lower dimensions in some sort of inverting process. Is it a perfect inversion is a great question. Are they exact inverses? Got like 20 minutes left, and that's the end of 5.3, so uh, maybe we can look at some problems I haven't done yet, and we can just try to find some integrals, maybe in small groups. This is going to require just some brain power of thinking about, you know, what do I take the derivative of to get that, like this one, right? So these can be harder problems, but... Uh, and it's a good process to go through. So, let's stop.